house. Let's go before the mercy seat. Father and glory, we come to give you glory. We come to give you praise. We come to acknowledge that you are supreme, that you are sovereign, and that you're more than enough. Thank you, God, just for being God. Being God alone, we thank you that with all the chaos and confusion, with all the hurt and the pain, we can still look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. God, our confidence is not on the government, it's not on the economy. Our confidence is in you, our Redeemer, our Savior. We thank you even now, God, for new life, eternal life, abundant life. We thank you for the Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of us. We thank you that every promise that you make, we say yes and amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you might continue to move and that your spirit might continue to tabernacle amongst us. We come to receive a touch and a word and an outpouring. So have your way. And however you choose to move, we'll be careful to give you the credit. We'll say that Jesus did it. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. And all God's children said, amen, amen, and thank God. Hallelujah. We continue to stand all over the house, wherever you are. Continue to stand in the overflow room, in the children's area, wherever you are as we continue to stand. Let's go into the Word of God today, John's Gospel, the 12th chapter, beginning reading in the 12th verse. We continue today in the series we've been sharing throughout the month of March on the general heading, The Road to Calvary. And we find ourselves here on Palm Sunday looking at this familiar text, John 12 and 12, as it appears on the screen. Come on, let's read together. Then the next day, a great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him, that they had done these things to him. Therefore the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Amen. This far the word of God. Look at somebody say, neighbor, in the name of Jesus, read the room. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your cooperation. May take your seats in the presence of the Lord as the Spirit does speak and God does God. We just want to use this as a subject for the next few minutes. Read the room. <laughs> Read the room. Brothers and sisters, one of the great tragedies of life is to misunderstand the nature of your relationship with other people. Well, when you look at someone as friend, but, but they see colleagues. But when you see someone as confidant, but they only see competition. When you see somebody as a mentor, but they see you as a friend, that lack of clarity can cause all kinds of confusion and misunderstanding and hurt feelings and anger. So, so can I just serve as your 20-second therapist? It ain't you. It ain't them. It's y'all. Y'all never got clarity about the nature of your relationship. And as a consequence, that's why your relationship has become a curse when it should have been a blessing. So, so, so today, if you don't mind, I want to investigate this Palm Sunday scripture from the perspective of relationships. Because in John's gospel, watch this, we see that Jesus is going viral. The Bible says that a great general crowd has gathered there for Passover in the city, and the word has spread. That Jesus of Nazareth is making his way in and in anticipation of his arrival. The Bible says that people started grabbing palm branches and started hollering out, Hosanna, 
Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And interesting, uh, Cheryl, I, I saw one commenter who actually said that that statement by itself wasn't that weird because anybody who was coming in could have been said they were coming in the name of the Lord. It was that next clause that shifted everything. They said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here it is, the king of Israel. And the word says that Jesus came in riding on the back of a donkey in order, listen, to fulfill scripture, which said, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus did not come in that day riding on the back of a horse, which was the animal of war that, that you went out and rode when you were invading a place, but he came riding on the back of a donkey, a peaceful animal, because he was coming as the prince of peace. I want you to hear this. That the Bible says that there was a mighty eruption in the, in the city, that, that Jesus was trending everywhere, that, that his, his face was all over people's timeline, that he was, he was going viral. But you got to understand that just like today, some things are short-lived. And while there was enthusiasm and excitement about his arrival on that day, you know that just within a few days, that enthusiasm would become excoriation and that, that excitement would become evil itself. What's your point? Here's my point, that when you look at the Palm Sunday group, you will notice, watch this, that there really are, in my estimation, four distinct groups that you ought to recognize because if you recognize these groups in the text, you'll start to recognize them in your life. I'm going to try it again. That, that, that the principles, the great part about being a believer is that kingdom principles are universally applicable for, for the academics in the house. What you learn about the word is generalizable, that, that it applies everywhere. And so I want you to consider the group, the groups that are here as uh, concentric circles. So you have the core, and the core relates to the disciples. The, then you have the congregation. The congregation are those that actually saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, according to the text. And not only did they see it, but they started telling people about it. The, the next group is the crowd. Somebody say the crowd. The crowd are, are those who did not see Lazarus raised from the dead, but they heard about it, and therefore they came to see Jesus. And then there's this fourth group. The critics. These are the hating Pharisees that always had something to say about God, no matter how good God had been and how much he had demonstrated his reality in the lives of people. Touch somebody and tell them, you know, somebody always has something to say. Uh-huh. And, and so watch me here because I just want to go through these groups and I'm going to head my, myself to the second service. So, so the first group I want to talk about is the core. Let's I say the core. I told you the core were the disciples. And here's what's interesting. Verse 16 says, watch this. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So, so the disciples, y'all know who they were. The disciples were those who had left their homes, left their families and their businesses to follow Jesus. They had, watch this, demonstrated commitment to Christ. And because of their commitment, they had to endure hostility and homelessness while traveling with Jesus around the region. And the Bible tells us that there were actually others, many others, that followed along. But after Jesus would say something or do something, they oftentimes would say, this is too deep for me. I didn't sign up for this. And they would walk away. But, but the 12, the disciples, they stayed with them. Can I tell you, everybody got a core. God has assigned to everybody under the sound of my voice a core group of people that are for you. 
They, they are committed to you. They, they want to see you soar. They want to see you successful. They want to see you prosper. They want to see you actualize the native potential that God has placed on the inside of you. Everybody, God has given you somebody who was in your corner and is rooting for you and pulling for you. And let me just put a pause in this point and say real quick, that's why you got to be careful about how you give up your core for some of these Johnny-come-latelys that show up in your life. I don't care how cool this new crowd is, they ain't got the kind of track record that your core does. That, that core wiped your behind. That core took care of you, paid your rent. That core lied for you so you could keep your job. Just keep looking straight. My point is, you ought to learn to dance with the one that brung you. Because the one that's with you may not be with you. They just might be trying to get something from you. Preach, pastor. Doing the best I can. Here it is. The Bible says that the disciples were with him. But here it is. Even though they were with him, they themselves did not really understand or appreciate what was happening at the time. I'll give it to you again. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. All I'm trying to get you to see, brothers and sisters, is that sometimes you can be close and still not get it. See, see, the disciples who lived with Jesus for three years should have been the ones that were most in the know. But at this point, it seems like they understand the least. And I'm going somewhere because at some point, brothers and sisters, you must recognize that while the core is with you, one of the shadow sides of the core is that sometimes the core can't see what God is doing new in you. Okay, I got some Bible to back it up. The Bible says that Jesus had been traveling throughout Asia Minor, opening blinded eyes and, and loosing stammering tongues and unstopping deaf ears. But when he went back home to Nazareth... The Bible says he could do no great work among them because of their disbelief. In fact, Jesus had to say publicly, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his kin. I need some Bible readers. Don't, don't you recall that right after Jesus had said to Simon, your name is no longer Simon, but your name is Petros, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the very gates of hell shall not prevail. Then Jesus started talking about the fact that he was going to be crucified, and Peter, well-wishing, well-intentioned, started trying to talk Jesus out of the sacrifice that he came to make. And when he started doing that, Jesus turned back to him and said, get behind me, not Simon, not Peter, but Satan. Because you have your mind not on eternal things, but on earthly things. Because anybody who talks against your destiny and your assignment in God is not working on the agenda of God at that time. So, so hear me, hear me real closely. I'm saying you need to stick with your core and the Bible tells us that there is safety and the abundance of counsel. That simply means that if you're scared to talk to anybody about it, it probably ain't a good idea. And the reason you want to talk about it is because you don't want nobody to talk you out of the foolishness you're about to get into. Just keep looking straight. Right? So, so you ought to be able to share. You ought to have counsel. Everybody ought to have an unofficial committee that you work with in your life to help give you advice and to help you to see your shadow side and to help you to see the mess you might be making. But at some point, you got to put the microphone down from asking everybody else and go into your prayer closet and ask your father to make clear his desire and design for you. Can I preach like I want to? Just recently, a real good friend of mine was trying to make a decision, and, and, and rightfully so, she was polling all the people in her life. She talked to her family and talked to her friends and talked to people who were further along, but when my wife talked to her, she said, listen, I appreciate you talking to everybody, but at some point, you need to stop talking to us, and you need to start talking to God, because he knows what's best. He knows the plan that he has for you. I wonder if I got about 100 people in here that are glad to know that you can hear the voice of God for yourself and his voice will never contradict his word and his word will be magnified by those who are godly in your camp. Look at somebody real quick and say, neighbor, I'm glad that God will talk to me 
about me. I'm glad that he knows my number. He knows how to get a hold of me. He knows the very way that I take. He knows how to counsel me, and he knows how to comfort me, and he knows how to convict me, and he knows how to correct me, and he knows how to change me, and he knows how to transform me. Is there anybody here that's glad to know that you can hear the voice of God for yourself? There's a still, small voice that's called the Holy Ghost that will whisper words into your spirit. He'll whisper comfort when you're grieving and lonely. He'll whisper courage when your enemies seem to have you at the end. He will whisper counsel to you to show you how to navigate a difficult situation. Is there anybody here that's glad to know that you don't have to figure out life by itself, but God has given you himself and he will speak to you? And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own, and the joy that we share when we tarry there, none other. I feel like having church on Palm Sunday. Would you look at somebody and tell them he'll talk to you in every situation? And so, and so, and so. Uh-huh. Bible says the first group we're dealing with is is the core. But that's not the only group in the crowd. The second one is, is the congregation, is the congregation. Now, I told you who the congregation is. Watch this. Uh, verse 17 gives us an explanation. It says, so the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. So, so these were the folks that were around when he brought a man that had been dead for four days back to life. And, and listen, they saw it, but guess what? They didn't just see something. They said something. That, that they understood that God had made them witnesses, but there's no point of being a witness if you don't open up your mouth. <laughs> and, and, and so they served as Jesus' ministry workers. That they served as his, his street team. That they served as the ones that served as the front line to see the word throughout the city that the Messiah, the master, the anointed one, Jesus of Nazareth, was on his way in. I'm trying to get you to see this, practice because every, every person, not only do you have a core, but you also have a congregation. Now, now your core are those who are closest to you, and that's a small group. I can't emphasize that word enough, a small group. And the reason I'm pausing there is because so many of us keep trying to make our congregation our core. It's because we are so emotionally insecure and spiritually immature that we constantly seek the validation of others through applause and approval. But you don't need everybody in the house. You just need enough folks so you don't go out your natural mind. You got to have some folks that are outside the house that are aligned with the vision. Let me try it again. Your vision is what draws people into the congregation. The, 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 the core is there for you. The congregation is there for what you represent. And, and, and here it is. If your vision can be accomplished by you alone, your vision is too small. You ought to have a vision for your life, a plan for your life, a, a desire for your life that requires the need for somebody else to catch it and run with it. And, and here's the good part, y'all about to shout on this, that every person in here, if you have vision enough, there's somebody willing to catch it and run with it. That that, that there, God has already put people in place that are ready to fund your idea and to support your effort and to work with you toward uh, the accomplishment that God has sown into your spirit because he sold it into theirs as well. You, you, you need some people that, that are willing to volunteer for your mission and to promote your understanding of what it is that can be accomplished through you and through them. In other words, brothers and sisters, some folks will be there for you, but there's some folks that are there for what you can do if you give them something to work with. So, so let me ask you this question. 
what about you does somebody have to follow? See, leadership is a compelling influence that causes people to be stirred to action be behind what it is you're trying to do. The Bible says that the people who saw Jesus raise Lazarus began to be activated and testified to others about what they had seen. See, see, when God has done something in your midst, when you have witnessed and experienced the power of God, then it causes you to tell somebody else. Okay, let, let me see if I can do a little poll. Is there anybody here who started coming to this church, not because you saw an ad on YouTube, not because you got a mailer, but because somebody in your life said you got to come and check out this church? Is that anybody in here? Well, guess what? You're part of that congregation. Somebody was able to witness to you that there's something real and there's something supernatural, and you want to come and be a part of it. Nudge somebody real quick and say, neighbor, when you experience the power of God, you just can't keep it to yourself. That's what worship is all about. Worship is about us collectively expressing our individual experience with the God of eternity. I'll rewind it and say it again. I said worship is our collective expression of our individual experience with the God of the universe. When God has healed your body and God has brought your child back out the street and God has kept food on the table even though you ain't had no job and God has delivered you from addiction and and God has saved your soul and God has filled you with the power of the Holy Ghost and God has given you new purpose. When we show up together, you shouting about one thing and you shouting about something else and you shouting about something else but we all got a reason to give God praise. I can prove it right now. Is there anybody here that's a witness that God has been better to you than you've been to yourself? I'll give you 30 seconds of my sermon to go ahead and express your appreciation for the God of your salvation. You got about 20 more seconds. And by the way, if he ain't done nothing for you, you can sit down and be quiet. But if he's worked it out, if he's made a way, if he gave you another chance, now is the hour when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in... As a matter of fact, Aren't you glad that your neighbor didn't even know why you're shouting? Because if they knew the particularities of what God had to do just to get you to church today, they would switch their seat. But is there anybody here that can say, you don't know like I know what the Lord? And time. Uh, so, whew. Uh, y'all, y'all, y'all let me preach, let me preach. So, so, uh, you got, you got the core? Thank you, Lord. Got the congregation, and then you have the crowd. The crowd wasn't there to see what Jesus did. They just heard about what Jesus did. The, the people who were there went and told the people who weren't there, man, you should have been there. Real talk. He had been dead so long, his sister said, if you try to get him now, he going to stink because his body has decayed. And the Bible says, despite the facts, the faith started working. And can I preach it the way my granddaddy used to preach it? D Jesus said, roll away the stone. And then he didn't just say, come forth. He had to call Lazarus by name. 
Because if he had just said, come forth, David would have got up. Esther would have got up. Jehoshaphat would have got up. And so he had to be specific and say, Lazarus, come forth. And that word went searching throughout the grave and said, not you, not you, you. Come on back. God's got more time for you. And so when the crowd heard what Jesus had done, they came, watch this, with expectation. I'm about to, okay. So, so the first part, the congregation came out of experience. But, but the second group came, they had no experience, but they had expect. I'm going to try it again. See, when you start walking with God, you're really walking off of the experience of others. Okay, was anybody here beside me raised up in church? And, and you heard some church talk growing up, right? Like, it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Well, we heard stuff coming up in church like, he's a way maker. He's a burden bearer. And a heavy load. Sh- Anybody raised up in church like me? It's all, he's a heart fixer. And a mind regulator. And, and y'all, all that stuff sounded good, but it didn't really hit right until I kept living. I believed God, but I hadn't experienced God until the devil got busy. And when the devil tried to break my heart, I found out God really is a heart fixer. And when I almost lost my mind because of what life had thrown me, I found out for myself he really is a mind regulator. In other words, brothers and sisters, if you ain't got no experience, if you got expectation, expectation is enough for Jesus to come by and see about you. Give somebody a high five and say, neighbor, if you ain't experienced it yet, just keep waiting. Just keep believing. After a while, God will show himself mighty. God will show himself strong. They that wait upon the Lord. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk. Wait on the Lord means hold on to your expectation. Be of good courage means don't give up the faith and he'll come by and see about you. I got I to gotta, gotta get out of here. Uh, they got untold you everything I was supposed to tell you. We done talked about the core. We done talked about the congregation. We just dealt with the crowd. Uh, there's this one last group <laughs> we got to deal with. That's the critics. Now, now I want you to notice real close what the Bible says. Verse 19, watch this, says, The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, now, now the core, those are the folks with you. The, the, The congregation, those are the folks that are for the vision that God has given you. The, the crowd are those that come with expectation of you, but the critics are those who are against you. They just don't like you because you're you. Now, let me just say a word to the people pleasers in the house. If someone doesn't like you because you're you, by definition, that's their problem. There, there was a movie called School Days. And in the middle of the dance scene, after they did the butt, this guy sang a song that said, you can only be you, and I can only be me. If anybody doesn't like you for you, by definition, that's their problem. 
And it is not your assignment to try to twist yourselves into knots because they don't have sense enough to appreciate the goodness that God has made when he made you. So, so watch it now. The Bible says that the Pharisees were frustrated because up to this point, they had done everything within their power to mess with them. They, they had tried to discredit Jesus. They had tried to trap him with their tricks. They, they had done everything to try to stop him. And yet, despite their best efforts, the Bible says the people are shouting and waving palm branches. And I want to tell you something about the critics, that, that what they said was meant for evil, but it actually was ironically prophetic. Did you see it? They said, look, you can do nothing. The whole world has gone after him. The, 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 okay, let me try it again. The, fair, the, the core didn't say it. The congregation didn't say it. The crowd didn't say it. The ones who spoke the most about him were the critics. Okay, I'm going to try it again. They said, not the city of Jerusalem. They said the whole, they were talking in the future about how nations and continents would go after him, by how so civilizations would, would call him Savior. And they were the critics. Are you not hearing me? I'm trying to show you that God has a curious way of confirming who you are by the people on the devil's payroll. Okay, okay, you don't believe me? You, you remember in Exodus, the Bible says, and there came a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And the word says that this Pharaoh said, we must deal with these people. Look, the people of Israel are too many and too strong for us to handle. That Pharaoh, while he was hating, was actually acknowledging how strong and powerful they were. Y'all not happy. Okay. D don't you remember when David came back in and the sisters started singing, Saul killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands? And the Bible says from that day forward, Saul started looking to take David out because he said to himself, what more can he have but the kingdom? And he wasn't wrong because it wasn't too long before God took Saul out and put David in his place. Okay, don't you remember when Jesus went to the temple when he first started his ministry and there was a man with an unclean spirit in there and Jesus said he walked up to him and the man with the unclean spirit said, let us alone, what have we to do with you? Jesus of Nazareth, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Y'all not, in other words, you listen to the wrong stuff from your critics. Because if you're, if you're spiritually wise, you'll discover the critics ain't doing nothing but identifying who you really are in God. Sometimes your critics will see who you are in God before the core will. All right, all right. In other words, brothers and sisters, the Pharisees declared the whole world were going after him because they couldn't figure out after all the mess that they had done how Jesus was still moving forward. And brothers and sisters, that's how we've made it as a people. We didn't make it as a people because we've come on the easy way. We've had all kinds of trouble and enemies against us. We've had all kinds of systems arrayed against us, but we understood that even when they did their worst, God was at his best. I need a witness. Come here. For, for we understand understand that when Harriet Tubman was right here in Maryland bringing people from slavery into freedom, they had raised a bounty to have her killed. They had organized a group to capture her and to kill her. But despite what they did, all they did was acknowledge the fact that she was the black Moses that was leading her people into the promised land. But when Dr. Martin Luther King was organizing marches all over the South, Bill Connor and George Wallace and the White Citizens Council 
did everything they could to stop him, but they didn't understand that King understood that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it leans towards justice. Y'all not happy. When Barack Hussein Obama decided that he was going to run for president, he knew for certain that there would be tens of millions of Americans that would never vote for him. But he realized, I ain't worried about who's against me, because I know if God is for me, he's more than a whole world. You're not hearing it? When Nelson Mandela was locked in prison, they thought that they were going to kill the movement, but what they didn't realize was that they were making him a victim that put him on the world stage that caused the world to organize against the evil of apartheid. When, when Joe Biden said that he was going to have an African-American woman to serve as his vice president and Kamala Harris's name started coming to the top of the list, people, including her own father, spoke against her. But guess what? They could not stop what God had anointed and assigned for her life because if God has says it, the devil himself cannot pluck out of your God's hand what God has for you. I want you to give somebody a high five and say, neighbor... In the name of Jesus, don't worry about your critics because God is going to have the last word. So long, kingdom. May the Lord God bless you real good. But can I testify? The year was 1998. And Matt, we were in Louisville at the General Conference. I was the connectional president of the YPD, the Young People's Division of the whole AME Church. I was trying to move the organization forward, but, but some bishops and their wives decided I was moving too fast and I needed to be brought down a peg or two. They sent people to infiltrate the meeting I was leading, and they broke up the meeting, and then they told me in the hall afterwards that the word is if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll never pastor in the AME church. The year was 1998. I started working at Reed Temple as a youth minister in 1999. And I stayed there from 1999 till 2003 when I became the executive minister. And then in 2006, we went to Blair High School and started the North Campus, and I became the managing minister. I was the youth minister. I was the executive minister. I was the managing minister, but I still wasn't the pastor. And I'm saying to myself, God, I can't believe that you're going to allow some critics to have the last word God said, never ain't here yet. Fast forward to 2019, we're at at Ebenezer AME Church in Fort Washington, Maryland, when Bishop James LeVert Davis says, it is my privilege to appoint the founder and the pastor of the Kingdom Fellowship AME Church, Matthew Watley. What's your point, preacher? My point simply is this, that let your critics talk because God is going to have the last word in your life. Am I right about it? Can I get a witness? Is there anybody here that's ever seen people do their worst only for God to come in and flip the script and make your haters your elevators? Give somebody a high five and say, neighbor, the Bible says that he'll make your enemy your footstool. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Won't he work it out? Won't he make a way? Won't he prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies? Say yeah, say yeah, say yeah, yeah. I'm done preaching. But can I just take 30 seconds and give God praise? Because he's not just the alpha. He's also the omega. He's not just the first. He's also the last. He's not just the beginning. He's also the end. I need y'all to be Baptist for about 20 seconds. Put your arm around somebody. Rock them and shake them. Shake them and rock them. Rock them and shake them. Shake them and rock them. And say, neighbor, don't worry about your enemy. God 
God is still on the throne and he still has all power in his hand as surely as he kept us through slavery, as surely as he brought us through segregation, as surely as he sustained us through redlining, he's going to bring us through this as well. Do you believe it? Do you receive it? Well, don't act like it. Don't wait for the general election. But if you know God is faithful, shout right now. Thank him right now. Say yeah. Say yeah. Everybody standing, everybody standing. Listen, listen. All over the building, wherever you are, don't move, don't leave, don't get nervous. Because God is not done. The Bible says, after the Pharisees said their worst, Jesus kept riding into the city. Listen, your job is to keep riding. And to watch God take care of the rest. Can, can I pray for you? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this word that gives us clarity, insight, understanding into the various roles that people play in our lives and the roles you've called us to play in the lives of others. God, help us to understand our core from our congregation, from our crowd, from our critics. Most of all, God, help us to understand that you still have a word for us. That when my mother and father forsake me, you will bear me up. That God, ultimately, while there are people around, ultimately, it comes down to me and you. We came into this world alone, God, and we'll leave it just the same. We'll stand before your judgment seat by ourselves. But God, we thank you that we'll stand covered by the blood. And because we're covered, we'll know that you'll be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So now, God, I pray I intercede for anybody who was uncovered, anybody who was unsaved, that, that is not accepting the blood of Jesus over their lives. God, for anybody who's unsaved or unsure about what it means to be saved, God, bring them forth right now that they might come asking, what must I do to be saved? And that they'll find salvation at this altar. God, I also pray for anybody who is already saved. They're a Christian, but they're a homeless Christian. They don't have a church home where they're growing and getting stronger. God, give them to know it ain't enough to believe they need to belong to the house of God. They need to put their roots down. They need to make a commitment so they can grow as, as a disciple. Bring the harvest now, God, for their good and for your glory. And God, we thank you in advance for what you're about to do in this place. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. And all God's children said amen.